Henry Groover. <laughs> when it's full Henry Groover. Henry Groover. I know you better than you know yourself. You need someone to come home to. Well, you know, she was right. When I came home this last time I was gone, that house was empty. She was gone. And that was not a nice experience. I really missed her. Uh, that's when I really had my mourning. I had it when the thought came of putting her in the ground. I didn't want to do that, but I finally got over that. She was a wonderful woman. God used her to get me out there in the world. He had to get her out there into Europe before I would. Hallelujah. Oh, okay, I see the time, 734 there. Wow. Is my battery getting leaked? <laughs> hey, batteries, in the name of Jesus, get charged up. Hallelujah. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Well, anyhow. Okay, thank you. Thank you, brother. <laughs> There's no keyboardist to start playing. <laughs> I don't see anything. I don't see the red lights on the cameras going white. And <laughs> How many saw me on Sid Roth? Oh, quite a few. You know, that was a, a powerful ordeal a year ago, February. Supposed to have been January that we recorded, but a snowstorm came into lovely Charlotte, and they don't have snow plows. They had to bring them down from the Appalachians. To, and they ordered everybody off the streets. You'll be arrested. Your car will be impounded if you're caught on the streets. Only emergency vehicle. That's how much Charlotte was ready for four or five inches of snow. <laughs> <laughs> what would Phoenix do with five inches of snow? <laughs> Stay off the streets. <laughs> Don't get out on the road, please. <laughs> Bad enough when the first rain comes after months and those roads are, have oil slicks. So anyhow, um, that was the beginning, and uh, it, it was a struggle. And my Judith had begun to fail already. But she insisted that I go, and I went, and uh, I came home. Uh, I, I got the surgery. Well, it'll take too long to cover all that detail of just getting rid of the cancers. Basically, uh, <laughs> the, the, the doctor there in Omaha said, no, no plastic surgeon will touch you without really good insurance. No self-pay. No, no plastic surgeon will do self-pay here in Omaha or around. So that took that. I took it back home and said, well, praise the Lord. See, I'm going to believe God. Just let me believe God. Leave me alone. I can't. No doctor will do it. So we're all right. So they quieted down, except for Steve Quayle. That was September a year ago. September. And uh, then I left and went to Asia, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, and came back and uh, got back. And I was back for Thanksgiving. And then the 1st of December, Steve Quayle's on the phone. Henry, have you done anything about those cancers on your face? I said, uh, yeah, I've done it. I've taken care of it. Henry, what have you done? <laughs> I'm believing God. Well, Henry... You know the doctor that came up to you? I said, yes. Well, he's from, from Charlotte, North Carolina. I said, yeah. Well, he just got off the phone. And uh, he asked me if you had done anything yet, and I didn't know, so that's why I'm asking. Now, uh, <laughs> so you haven't done anything yet. I said, I'm believing God, Steve. He says, Henry, I don't want to violate your faith, but listen to this. Dr. Spate just told me that he has four plastic surgeons lined up in Charlotte, North Carolina that are willing to tackle those cancers and get rid of them. And the only thing they'll charge is basically materials they use, not for their service, the room, or anything. Now, when he said that, what did I think? 
the Lord brought back something to me very interesting. Remember the saying years ago? I mean, I'm so old, I must have been a young man when that first came out. The man that, that, that drowned in the flood got up to heaven, and Jesus said, what are you doing here? You're not scheduled to be here yet. He said, well, I was trusting you, but I drowned in a flood. You didn't answer my cry. And Jesus said, what do you mean? I sent you three boats and a helicopter. You refused them all and said I would deliver you. Now you got to go back and work that out. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you often wonder about what it is, you know, these people that die and they're dead or enough time to do communication on the other side. What, did, what, what really was the conversation that went on? Well, anyhow, that's what came to me, and it came to me so clear, and tremendous peace came over me, and I said, Steve, say no more, brother. I think I'm in trouble. I think I better accept, because this could be the helicopter. Four, four plastic surgeons. He says, you'll accept then. I said, yeah, I will. He says, well, all right, I'm going to get hold of Dr. Spate, and you'll begin receiving texts of each of these four plastic surgeons. You get to pick out which one you want. I only read the second text, and this man served in emergency in five hospitals there in Charlotte, especially with, with victims going through windshields or faces are all cut up and these kind of things, you know, gunshot wounds that they figure, disfigure, and all that. But the thing that cinched it for me was he said, I'm a Christian, and every year I give so much time to go to Africa to do surgeries for people with cleft lips and radical injuries on their face. And I said, that's the one I want working on me. And so seven and a half hours later, he's needling my face to deaden me because I chose to stay awake and communicate with him while he cut on me, which is not normal. <laughs> I chose that, and he said, what is your pain tolerance? I said, well, my family and I think it's very high. He said, well, it needs to be. He says, no, I would choose that, but very few will do that. It's going to be painful, even with deadening your face, just the needling, all the needling to deaden your face. But also when they go in and he's cutting this way, he said, when I get near a nerve, I want you to just go, uh, don't smile, don't talk, just uh, you'll know when I'm getting near a nerve. And I will mop the blood and I will carterize it. And uh, oh, the carterizing was electronic. And that hurt all the way to my toes, even though my face was dead. Ah, hurt. I got to the place that when that machine come on to carterize, I would take as deep a breath as I could and hold my breath so I could gently exhale while he's carterizing because the smell of burning flesh nauseated me. It was an ordeal for seven and a half hours. He would cut on me, send it to the lab, cut on me in the other place, send that to the lab, go back and cut on this worst one. Had my nose laid over on my side, was up in there getting all the fingers, fingers around my eyes. I literally looked like I had gone through a windshield <laughs> without stopping and breaking the glass with my face. Uh, 350 stitches on the external. He never would tell me how many were internal that would dissolve. I looked horrible. Hallelujah. He said, one benefit of this, Henry, you're going to have less wrinkles when I'm done. Some people pay just for that. I said, thank you, doctor. I'm really not concerned about that. I've earned those wrinkles. <laughs> he chuckled. When I went back in the second time to have the stitches removed, the receptionist went over the intercom and said, people, Peace just walked back in the door. And I turned and I said, I'm the only one in the, in the room here, waiting room. Who is peace? She said, you. When you were here last time in that seven and a half hour surgery, 
the other patients and all, and the doctors and the nurses and all, had never experienced a day of such peace in all their profession. We talked about it ever since. We loved it. Normal complainers didn't complain a bit. I said, you know something? Thank you for that, ma'am. I want you to know something. If I didn't have overwhelming peace, I would have never come the first time. And I wouldn't go back again the second time. I'd take the stitches out myself <laughs> if I don't have peace. Remember, that's what he told me right on the streets of West Phoenix, Arizona, the second Saturday night. I'll give you peace. He said, start walking. I'll give you peace and a song. And if at any time you lose peace and you can't remember the song, turn around and go back and find the peace in the song. Never go without peace in a song. That peace in that song has guided me to doors, has guided me to places. I have lost count of the number of suicides that I have interrupted following the peace of God. Yes, it's not always convenient. I've had to get up in the middle of the night and get in the car and go and follow the peace of God across country to find who it is is despaired of life. I've had to go knocking on doors and knock and knock and knock them. I felt my knuckles were going to bleed, interrupting the suicide, and had them open the door and about hit me in the face, opening the door. What is your problem? Why do you keep beating my door? That's the fifth time you were knocking on my door. You don't have to take your life. Jesus gave it so you can have life and have it abundantly. She grabbed my collar, pulled me inside and said, you see that? Yeah, it's a hangman's noose. Every time I go up on the banister there and get the noose around my neck and go to jump off, I wanted to die in peace. Somebody's banging on my door. <laughs> Five times I had to go back banging on that door. The fifth time the Lord said, keep knocking until the door is open. I almost hit him in the face. I had peace like a river. I got peace like a river. When you got peace, you can proceed. If you don't have peace, don't go. That's your rule. That's your GPS. And believe me, it's better than GPS because GPS will take you on goose chases sometimes. <laughs> I don't always, I carry a hard print map just to make sure GPS is right because <laughs> they've taken me to the other side of town in the middle of nowhere. And I've been late for meetings because of GPS. Thank you, GPS. I don't know what you do, why you do that, but anyhow. <laughs> You're out to lunch too long, I think. <laughs> but anyhow, so anyhow, that, that, that was a tremendous experience. Well, then I, I went back on the last year in February to Charlotte to get this lifted a little further. He had to do another skin graft. And, you know, that took another 11 days. He still wants to do a little more because he's concerned about it too low. You see, one eye is open more than the other. When Jesus heals, you don't have those problems. But Dr. Bickett is a wonderful man, a very professional man. You can't even see where all the other stitches were. Just took away all my wrinkles. Hallelujah. <laughs> Gave me a facelift, people. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> People say, you look so young. I said, well, thank you, Dr. Bickett. <laughs> Took away my wrinkles. I had some deep ones. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, got that done. And he pulled those stitches out the 11th day. And he says, well, what's next? I said, well, I got to drive to Phoenix, Arizona. He says, drive? Why? I said, in three days, I got I to gotta fly to Asia. He said, in three days, it's going to take you three days to drive there. Come on out in the hall. Went out in the hall. He says, read those signs up, up the hallway there. So I just start reading them. Boom, 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 747, you know, the exit. And, and he says, oh, get out of here. He says, you got better vision than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so I got here. And then I, I had lunch with my, my daughter. And we both had the lovely salad. With, with, with chicken breasts on it, rotisserie. And then I got Simonella poisoning on the flight that night and put in a hellish flight all the way, 14 hours of hell in the air. Ah, oh, dear Lord. You know the devil doesn't like me. And the feeling is mutual. I don't like him either. One person said to me, well, boy, he's sure mad at you. I said, hey, wait a minute. The devil's always been mad. That's nothing new. 
my goodness, no, that, that, that doesn't entertain me a bit. I mean, he's always been angry. But um, got to, got to tai, Taipei, Taiwan, got to the hotel, exhausted, up and down, up and down. I'm, ugh, talk about purging. Hobbled, hobbled down to the, the breakfast table that morning in the hotel there. And George is there, my scheduler and planner, and he takes one look at me. He says, you look like death warmed over. Was the flight that bad? I says, I am sick. Well, he had introduced me to a lady at the next table and two ladies, Chinese ladies, and I just nodded, greeting them. Never met them before. Start explaining what my problem is. The lady across from me on the seat there reaches down her purse, notepad and pen, and she's writing away. She hands it to George. George picks up his phone and makes a call. And he's talking to his wife. I know when he talks to his wife, he talks different. And uh, <laughs> guys, you understand that. <laughs> and <laughs> sorry, ladies, nothing personal, okay? And uh, <laughs> yes, honey. Even in Chinese, you know when they're saying yes, honey. Yes, honey. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Languages don't bother me again. It's, it's, it, it, it's the body language. I've learned body language. It speaks very clear to me, whatever language they speak. And, uh, and as soon as he hung up, I didn't know this lady could speak English, and she starts speaking to me, and she says, now, when his wife, George's wife, gets those things, I want you to start taking what I'm written down here in English very immediately, and you take it exactly as I say. I am the number one gastrological medical doctor of Beijing, China. You see, God gives me the best. Dr. Bickett is one of the best, they said, of all the plastic surgeons of Charlotte, North Carolina. And then he, he puts right across the table from me the best one in Beijing, China. She'd come for the four-day conference there in Taipei, was going to fly back. She stayed and extended two more days. And then she said, listen, I, I think we've got you kind of stabilized. And uh, if you have any trouble when you go over to Okinawa, have, let George know, I'll fly to Okinawa and doctor you there. She never sent me a bill yet. Think about it. Isn't God good? Well, anyhow, that was the lovely ordeal. I, I lost a lot of weight and uh, uh, got home in April. And uh, my children were concerned about me. And uh, I wasn't doing well. I, I, I was kind of able to eat a little bit, but boy, that Simonella poisoning is really wicked. You know, it, it can bounce back on you before you realize it. And uh, why did you get it? I don't know. I asked blessing over the meal with my daughter. You know, I, I, all I know is it just, the scripture just says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. And, and I have to believe that, don't I? Just leave it alone. I don't question God. He has a purpose for everything. Got to know that doctor from Beijing very well, and she's a wonderful lady, and just a very professional person, and very, very highly respected in Beijing, and wants me to come back to Beijing. You remember I went there the last time as the ambassador of the United States. That's God's doing. You see what I mean? That's, God just opens doors for me, and I wind up in places where I'm saying, Lord, how did you do this? It's awesome. But... Uh, Anyhow, uh, so that was the situation. Got pretty well stabilized, came home, and began planning my trip for east. And uh, there was some people up in, uh, up in Canada that needed some serious prayer in Toronto, and it would mean some deliverance. So I thought, well, I'll fast several days before I go. That was a no-no. If you ever have Simonella poisoning and you begin to stabilize your digestive system, do not go on a fast for at least six to eight months, maybe a year. That's just simple wisdom. If you don't believe it, go ahead and violate it. You'll be sorry. It threw me right back into the total thing as though I had just got it again. I wasn't eating. I was in horrible condition. And in Toronto, they kind of helped me a little bit. But I headed home because I wasn't going on. And... Uh, got back home and my Judith was then at the point where she was not going to last long. By then it was, it was uh, early June. And uh, so I decided to stay home. And uh, Well, then I was doing so badly 
that my two, two daughters, my next, the youngest and oldest daughter, said, Dad, you need to go to Toronto. You need, they helped you out up there. You need to go. You're, you're losing weight. You're not sleeping. You're not digesting right. They really helped you. Please go. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not leaving. I don't want to be gone if my, my Judith goes. I've asked the Lord to let me be here. And I, well, you're not going to live because you're, you're losing weight terribly. You're just a skeleton. And they kept after me. So finally I said, okay, I'll go for four days. So I flew up there. I won't drive. I'll fly. Well, I got up there, and they were treating me, and I, I actually slept five hours that night. First time I had slept in five hours since whew, way back before I got the poisoning. And I was feeling pretty good, but then my left kidney began passing kidney stones and went into five days of pain trying to pass the kidney stone without any painkiller or anything, trusting the Lord. And uh, then, then that one passed, and I thought I was in heaven. I opened my eyes. I literally thought I died and went to heaven. No pain, just like flipping a switch, no pain. And I felt great. I opened my eyes, and there I was on the floor. I had been pushing my back here because I couldn't hold it long and my fingers would cramp, try to suppress the pain. So I'd push against the corner of the closet against the big heavy bed, foot of the bed. I could do my legs that last longer than my fingers would. <laughs> and I could endure the pain that way, crying out to the Lord. And then about 20 minutes of that, they actually had some food fixed up for me. I have five days and nights of that. And then the right one began trying to pass. And uh, in that process of time, my, my bladder shut down and my prostate shut down and I couldn't urinate. My stomach started getting big as a nine-month pregnant person. And uh, on the third day of that uh, right kidney stone trying to pass, they talked me into going to a hospital, a man named Paul. And they were crying out to the Lord on their faces and weeping for me. They were afraid I was going to die. I, was, it, it, I don't know if you ever passed kidney stones, but boy, I tell you what, you don't use anything for the pain. It's, it's painful. It hurts. And it'll wear you out. And uh, they talked me into going to the hospital. Well, I didn't have any assurance. I mean, insurance again. And so they didn't, they didn't catheterize me. They didn't offer to. They just sucked some blood out of me and said, you have a very serious infection and we don't have room for you. You have no insurance, so goodbye. And so I went, they carried me back. And, and this pain began like hiccups of my abdomen going up toward my heart. And that was worse than the kidney stone. And so I had four days, three days and nights of that. And, uh, they called my family back in America and said, you better come kid Henry. We're afraid he's going to die on us. He just, he, he doesn't want to go to the hospital anymore, anywhere. He doesn't want to take anything for the pain. And Henry's wearing out. Come and get him, please. We don't want him to die. So my youngest son got a ticket and flew up there. They put me in the hotel by the airport. And he, his flight kept getting delayed. He finally got there at 1030 that night. And, uh, they had to leave. They had another commitment that took me there. So they weren't there. And when I, he got there, he saw me in pain until five o'clock in the morning. He began weeping and he said, Dad, I can't stand it. You're not, you're in no condition. You're not going to, they're not going to let you on a plane. I'm calling the ambulance. Don't tell me not to. I don't want you dying. So the ambulance came when they put the stethoscope on my chest. Boy, I tell you, I've never been whipped up onto a gurney faster in my life. They had me on that thing so fast, strapped me in and wheeling me out to the ambulance. And uh, my son said, could I go along? I, I, I don't know where you're going and I want to stay with my dad. Yes, get up front. And so on the way, I heard the ambulance attendant, the one attending me, calling the hospital. We're approximately two and a half minutes from our arrival. Uh, prepare ER for resuscitation. Our patient is in the throes of a major heart attack. And I thought, who's he talking about? This was a very different pain. I didn't feel like an elephant on my chest. It was horrible, though. It was terrible pain, and I was strapped in. I couldn't, I couldn't double up because you're strapped in. You can't. That was worse yet. And we get there, and they take us quickly into ER, and they ask the lovely question, what kind of insurance have you got? Well, no insurance. So they leave me there for an hour and a half, and they're bringing other patients in. 
And finally, an hour and a half later, my son is pleading with him. I have a credit card. I'll pay for all the costs, whatever it is. You'll be paid. Take care of my dad. They won't do it. Well, one of the doctors came out to get a patient headed back in, and he overheard the other doctor say to me, is that old junkie still out there on the, on the, on the paramedics gurney? They wouldn't let him, let him pull me off onto a stretcher because then they're responsible for me, see? And I don't have any insurance. So I had to stay on it, and the paramedics are just standing there. They're calling other hospitals. They won't take me. So I'm stuck in ER. <laughs> Lovely. Hallelujah. God was working on it. You know, everything has a time, doesn't it? And so anyhow, uh, he hears that doctor say to the other one, is that old junkie still out there on the paramedic stretcher? And the nurse told me this. He went stomping in there and he said, did you just refer to my dad as an old junkie? And that doctor said, well, he is, isn't he? Look at him, he's just skin and bones, his stomach is swollen, he's obviously overdosed on something. And boy, my son started reading them the riot act. I've never seen my dad take an aspirin, let alone any medication, never have a cigarette or any liquor, any drugs. What do you mean? He's a sick man, take care of him. And he was pleading with them. When this doctor walked into ER at five o'clock in the morning to wash up for surgery, she heard my son pleading with those two doctors in there and came right in and said, what's the problem? And he said, that's my dad out there on the, on the gurney and they think he's a junkie and he's not a junkie. I'm trying to get them to help my dad. And she got her stethoscope, come over to me and she listened to my chest and I'll tell you what, when she listened to my chest, she went into action. I mean, she screamed. Get me a gurney, stat! I mean, move! Unstrap him! By the time that gurney come up alongside, boom, they put me over on that, and I heard the paramedic saying, it's about time. And down the hall we went, and she was pushing right, right behind my head, and she was saying to me on the way, sir, we're going to do everything we can to save you, but you're going to have to fight on this one because if you don't fight, we're going to lose you. Please fight, sir. Please fight. And I thought, well, okay. We got into this room, and the last thing I remember, they come at me. To me, it was a needle this long. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what my thought was? Go ahead. Poke me wherever. Nothing can hurt more than I've been hurting. And whatever hit me, I went out. I didn't wake up till 4 o'clock the next day. And... Uh, my big belly was gone. First thing I did, wow, my stomach's gone. The nurse said, yeah, they drained from you three liters of urine in the first hour, and they've been draining urine every hour after that, at least a liter for several hours. And named the doctor and said, she cannot understand why you didn't die. Is it uratic? Uratic poisoning. Your bladder, we don't know why it didn't burst. You should be a dead man. Well, they, they worked on me, and they put me through all kinds of different tests and had me on IVs, and, and by that evening, I, I wanted to get up. They didn't want me to. They said, you're still, your heart is very weak. You might drop dead on us. I said, no, I'm, fail, I'm fine. I got up and took the IV thing and did three laps all the way around the hospital. All the nurses are looking at me, and... Some of them are out there walking right beside me, afraid I'm going to drop dead, you know. <laughs> They're amazed. Well, then the fourth day, the nurse comes in, the, the head doctor comes in, the one that rescued me. And she comes in, she's standing at the foot of my bed, and she says, well, she said, uh, I just talked to your son. He's down having breakfast. But uh, I'm arranging papers to send you home. Uh, we've stabilized your kidneys and your liver. They were all shut down. And uh, you don't know how close you were to death. And I said, doctor, I don't know how to, how, to, how to thank you for what you've done. And she said, don't thank me. Thank your son. Because if I wouldn't have heard him when I came into ER, I wouldn't have come and questioned what's, what's going on but I'm the head doctor here. 
And when I listened to your heart, I knew you were in the thralls of a major heart attack. I said, well, I didn't feel any elephant on my chest or anything. I just felt this like a hiccup pain hitting me down in my abdomen, going up, and when it hit my heart, the pain was so severe I thought I'd pass out. And she said, that is a very, she said, I'm a specialist in this. See, he gave me another specialist. That is one of the rarest forms of this particular type of heart attack known to man. No one ever lives more than 30 minutes from the time that hits them. And I said, doctor, I had that for three days and three nights. Her eyes got big and she said, impossible. Impossible. Did you hear me holler, stat, I want a gurney now? When I heard what your heart was doing, I knew you were in the thralls of that type of a major heart attack, and I had but minutes to begin trying to get you revived. And she said, the pain doesn't come from your abdomen up like a hiccup. Your brain interpreted it that way. It's from your heart telling your vital organs, I'm shutting down. You're not supporting me. Your liver and your kidneys and all were shut down. You were dying. Within a half an hour, you would have been wheeled off to the morgue. And I said, well, that's what that doctor in ER said. Within a half an hour, they'll wheel him out of here to the morgue. So he knew, see, but he wouldn't make a move. But the doctor wasn't there yet, the specialist. Hallelujah. Isn't God awesome? He's so awesome. You see, sometimes you just got to wait. You got to be patient in your pain. Now, when I battled the cancer 11 years before, I would pass out when it'd get too bad. I'd go unconscious and get a rest, and then I'd come to. And you maybe heard me standing here talking about it. I'm not worried about pain. Your body has an automatic shutoff valve. But this time, with the, all the kidney stones, everything, the Lord wouldn't let me go unconscious. I had to endure it fully alive and alert. You know? Remember the song they sing, sang years ago? Fully alive in the spirit, Lord, make me fully alive, <laughs> you know? Well, this was spirit, soul, and body. I was fully alive, and I couldn't go. I wanted to go unconscious at times with those kidney stones, believe me. But I didn't. I had the poor people that trying to help me on their faces, bawling their eyes out, begging God to heal me. Please, God. They told me, we don't ever want to go through that again with a man of faith like you. You put us through it, Henry. <laughs> We would have given up and died a long time before, several days earlier. You're amazing. Well, anyhow, that head doctor stood there. And uh, so she said, you don't, don't need to thank me. Thank your son. Because if I wouldn't have heard him, you'd have been dead within a half an hour. And when I told her I had that pain for three days and nights, she, her eyes got big and she said, that's impossible. Nowhere in the books of any records does a person live longer than 30 minutes in that. I said, ma'am, I'm a Christian. And I have a strong faith in Jesus Christ. She looked at me and smiled and she said, well, I'm Islamic. This whole hospital is Islamic. I thought, thank you, Lord, for letting me walk in the Middle East among those Muslim people and for giving me a love for them. And I said, you know, I've walked all over from Turkey to Egypt in the Middle East, and I love the Islamic people. I said, I've been in your number three Mecca, and I've told your top iman, your top iman, iman, I'll get it right. I asked him to forgive us for the Crusades, and I was weeping. She said, you're a good man. I said, I love you people, and Jesus loves you. I said, could I tell you something really precious? And she said, yes. And she came and sat down right by my knee on the side of the bed and took my hand in her two hands. And I started sharing heaven with her. And she began weeping. And she said, that's wonderful. Tell me more. Same thing that high Buddhist priest did. That's wonderful. Tell me more. You see, these people that believe in other gods, we know what the Bible says. The gods of this world are idols. They're just made with men's hands. They can bring comfort, peace, healing for anything. 
And I was telling her, she kept saying, that's wonderful. She was crying and I was crying. And I was talking about heaven. And then she looked at her watch. She says, oh, you've done it. You've made me late again. I was late for surgery. We kept delaying surgery the other morning when I came in and found you there. And now all my staff is waiting on me and I'm late for the meeting. I'm sorry, I don't want to, but I've got to get into the meeting. They're all waiting. And uh, she got up, but instead of going out of my room, she went into my toilet and shut the door. And I have never heard a woman cry so loud in all my life as she was crying. She was sobbing such deep sobs. And I could hear her pulling the toilet paper and the, and the tissue boxes, you know. I don't know how long she was in there sobbing, but then she come out after a while with two hands full of, full of tissue. And she looked at me with still tears just running down her face. She said, I don't know how to thank you for what you've done. It was so wonderful, but I'm late. I got to go, and away she goes. Those doctors and nurses were so kind and so cheerful to me after that. And when they wheeled me out in the wheelchair... They were all lined up down the line right there by the door where I was going out to get in the taxi, waving and goodbye. And God got a hold of those precious Islamic people. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, I want to I wanna close this off with this. You've got to hear this. You've got to hear this. I did fly home, yes. And I got home, I was weak as a kitten. I couldn't, I couldn't take five steps without a walker. And uh, I would get up with a walker and I'd try to walk. And uh, I did get up to about 30 steps. And, uh, but then I'd, I'd have to go back and lay down and I'd just fall off into sleep again for two hours. And I was determined I'm not staying in that bed. And... Uh, I don't know, second or third day I was home. Uh, I went to sleep that night about 10 o'clock. Judith had quieted down and went, finally went to sleep. And I had spent a lot of time at her side. And so I thought, well, I'll go to sleep. And uh, I looked at the clock and it was, uh, it was 10, 10 o'clock and at night. And I fell off into sleep and I woke up. And our oldest daughter was right there in the kitchen. They had moved my bed down where I could be close to Judith. And I looked at the clock, and it was 10.15, and it was all dark outside. And I thought it was still night, or I had slept 24 hours. And I said, wow, it's 10.15. I went to sleep 15 minutes ago. And she said, Dad, no, you didn't. You went to sleep at 10 last night. You have just been sleeping. I checked on you several times to make sure you were still breathing. I thought you had died. You were so, so relaxed. I said, I slept 12 hours and 15 minutes. Why, if it's 10, 15 in the morning, why is it so dark outside? I can see the street lights on. She said, over three counties here is a, is a killer storm. The, the clouds are down. It's so black. They've been warning. Get to a basement. If you don't have a basement dwelling, find one and get in it. Don't get in your vehicle. Get in a basement. There are going to be clusters of tornadoes all over this county and damaging, killing hail. Any second, it's going to break loose. The entire three counties were blood red. And uh, I'm, I'm laying there and I'm thinking, you foul devil. And Jesus walks up beside the bed. And he says to me, Henry, the death angel has been coming repeatedly to me, demanding your life, but I have denied it. I am putting a rod of authority in your hand, and in my name, you must drive that death angel away. You must be the one to drive it away. This is your test. And the Lord disappeared. And I took that rod and I started pounding that foul death angel. If I could, could have seen him, I believe feathers were flying everywhere. <laughs> Boy, he got so much beat up, he, he, he hobbled away. You know what I mean? I just kept wielding that and, uh, until I was exhausted. And then I relaxed and laid back. And the Lord come beside my bed again. 
And he said, you passed the test. I'm making a new covenant with you for life. I'm going to heal you and I'm going to restore you. And you're going to be stronger than you were before all of this. Hallelujah. 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 Now he said, you're going to have some very severe tests and trials between now and the time you're healed. But after I totally heal and restore you, I'm going to send you across the earth and you are going to impart to those that have interceded and travailed for you. And you are going to impart to them an anointing and a blessing. And they will know it when they receive it. And it's going to change their life. It's going to do something in them that they have been crying out for as a reward for their faithfulness of interceding for you. And the Lord disappeared. People, I'm, I'm in that test. It's been very severe. It's been some very severe tests. Uh, but I uh, haven't got my new bladder, my new prostate yet, but I do by faith. I'm waiting for it. But uh, the reason I'm heading for Asia is because I was laying there and believing God in, Arizona, in, in Iowa and uh, saying, wait a minute, Lord. Every miracle I have got, the brand new hips, the healing of the cancer, the broken foot that was so big, my toenails fell off, couldn't put a shoe or sock on. I went on to Japan and was hobbling along with crutches, walking and praying on my heel without a cast or anything on it. I bent it back in place again, reset it myself in the name of Jesus, about passed out. And after 10 days, God gave me a, a new, new, new foot, you know. Took me over a year to get my toenails back, but had healed it and I could put my shoes on and walk. And all of those miracles and many others was when I go. And so I'm going, I'm going by faith. I'm going. And that's why I decided I'm leaving. I normally go to Asia this time of the year. I'm going, I'm going to get my, my new organs on the go. Hallelujah. The great commission says, go ye. And I don't know where the Lord ever rescinded that. So I'm going. And I'm believing I'm going to, they were healed as they went. There were many that were healed as they went, weren't they? And so that was what came to me. And that's the reason I'm here tonight and, and on the go and believing God. And, and my strength is good. My appetite is good. I, I, I get enough sleep a night and uh, I'm praising the Lord. And uh, it's always a test to fly when you've got to self catheterize. And if you don't do it on time, you've got a mess on your hands. But uh, that's all right. Uh, we're going to do it. I'm going to make it. And I pray that by May the 2nd, when I come back to Phoenix, Arizona from Asia, I pray that I'm going to be able to report. Believe me, I'll report beforehand. I'll get a hold of you beforehand, Greg. You'll know before May the 2nd when, I, when that miracle happens. But uh, <laughs> hallelujah. We walk by faith, not by sight. And I've kept you later than I had planned on keeping you, but uh, did you learn something tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. Did he challenge you a little bit? Hallelujah. You see, now. When is now? now. What is now? now? Now is faith. Hallelujah. Now is faith. Now is faith. You're going to take now with you into eternity. Now is timeless. Amen? Amen? Take faith with you because without it, you're still not going to please the Lord if you don't have it in heaven. And you got to have it now. Hallelujah. And now will be the same tomorrow as it is right now. It never changes. So hang on to Jesus and fight your fight of faith. I know many of you have had a difficult year last year. It seems that last year was a fiery trial year. How many know that? Look at this. Father, keep those hands up. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know the details of every single one of these fiery trials. 
that they themselves individually are fighting or their family has been subjected to, their business, their job, whatever. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let that faith be fully operative within them, Lord. Bring them through into triumph and victory, I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Let faith arise in their hearts. Give a new measure of faith into them right now. Let it come up within them. Let it arise, even as the song we sang. Arise, arise, faith, arise within them. Lord, that we may truly be your pleasure and that you may be pleased with us. That by the time I see them next time, Lord, whenever it is, that every person with those hands up will have an individual bushel basket of testimonies of look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done as I have put my faith in them because as the word says, let all of you who put your faith in the Lord rejoice. Rejoice! Rejoice! Hallelujah! 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 We rejoice in you, Lord. We rejoice. We rejoice. Wow.